Homeland Security in Israel, Module 3, Counterterrorism Strategies, by Nadav Morag. In this third module of this series, we will turn to the issue of Israel's counterterrorism policies and specifically focus on deterrence, intelligence, prevention, executive action, and public cooperation efforts. Generally speaking, terrorists cannot be deterred from carrying out acts of terrorism by the knowledge that they may die or be incarcerated for long periods of time, particularly in the case of suicide terrorism. Israeli deterrence policy has thus traditionally focused in two different areas, the terrorists' family members and morale within the terrorist organization. Israel had a long-standing policy, which has been challenged through judicial means both in Israel and internationally, of destroying the homes of arrested terrorists or those who died in the course of their attacks. This policy has recently formally been cancelled. The logic behind this policy rested on the idea that while a terrorist might have been willing or was planning to sacrifice himself or herself, they would not want their family members to suffer undue harm, and the destruction of the family's home represents a significant financial loss that would cause the family to suffer. Over the years, however, Palestinian organizations and Arab governments routinely donated money to such families to cover the costs of rebuilding, and, consequently, the adverse financial impact was minimized. Moreover, there was never any clear proof that this policy actually deterred terrorists from carrying out attacks though there was some anecdotal evidence to this effect. Indeed, during the height of the Second Intifada, donations by Arab governments to families of terrorists created a small class of nouveau riche Palestinians whose sons or daughters had blown themselves up in Israeli cities. A marginally more effective Israeli policy has been the public exposure from time to time of the modus operandi of terrorist organizations. This policy is designed to show the terrorists that their organization has been infiltrated and that the Israeli authorities thus have access to the most sensitive information within the organization. This often leads to the development of a sense of mistrust within the organization and lowers morale. Israel's policy of large-scale arrests as well as of targeted assassinations, more of which will be discussed later in the module, is also designed in part to lower morale by proving to the members of the terrorist organization that the organization is incapable of protecting them and is thus weak in comparison with Israel's counterterrorism capabilities. The primary agencies for implementing these policies are the Israel Defense Force and the Israel Security Agency. As is well known to everyone in the counterterrorism business, Intelligence plays a central and critical role in addressing the terrorist threat. For Israel, a small country with a small standing army that traditionally relied on early warning in order to mobilize its comparatively large reserve military forces, intelligence has always been the key to defense. This traditional focus on intelligence also served and continues to serve the country well with respect to thwarting terrorist activities. Israeli intelligence efforts focus on identifying potential threats at the organizational and individual level, uncovering sources and methods for financing and provision of other infrastructure-related activities, and uncovering sources of arms and cooperation with like-minded intelligence services. As noted earlier, cooperation between intelligence agencies is generally good. Following the outbreak of the Second Intifada, or Al-Aqsa Intifada, as the Palestinians called it, the ISA and IDF developed an effective system for real-time horizontal information sharing, which enabled tactical units in the field to exchange intelligence information instead of waiting for intelligence to be pushed up the chain of command and then cross over to the sister agency. This tactical-level information sharing has resulted in significant gains in terms of arrests of suspected terrorists and disruption of terrorist activities. Generally speaking, the IDF-ISA relationship revolves around the IDF providing personnel to go in and make arrests or destroy bomb-making facilities, tunnels, and the like, as well as providing much of the SIGINT intelligence gathering, 
while the ISA focuses more on recruiting and running Palestinian agents, and thus focuses on the human piece of the puzzle. It is not unusual for IDF platoons entering a particular locality in the West Bank, as well as the Gaza Strip prior to Israel's withdrawal from that territory, to be accompanied by the ISA case officer who runs agents in that village or neighborhood. Unlike IDF personnel, who cycle in and out and rarely have expertise with respect to a particular Palestinian locality, the ISA case officers are the true experts with intimate knowledge of the area and the people in it, some of whom pass on information to the case officer. If Israeli intelligence has an Achilles heel, it is with respect to strategic rather than tactical intelligence, at least with respect to the Palestinian theater of operations. Israel has rarely been able to predict macro events, such as the outbreak of both Palestinian intifadas, or to understand the course such events are likely to take. And consequently, it has not been able to plan policies, allocate resources, and build force structures proactively. Improvements in Israeli counterterrorism efforts have appeared in the wake of learning curves rather than in anticipation of expected events. After intelligence gathering efforts have borne fruit, the Israeli security establishment typically commences with preventive efforts. Israel's counterterrorism strategy is based on the assumption that if terrorists cannot be apprehended, killed, or otherwise have their work disrupted before they set off on their mission to attack Israel's population centers, then the terrorists will be successful, and Israel's counterterrorism policy will be deemed a failure. Hence, preventative activities play a central role. Due to the short geographic distances between the terrorists' base of operations in the villages and cities of the West Bank or Gaza Strip and Israeli urban centers, which in the case of the West Bank are often a 10 to 30 minutes drive away, if a terrorist and his, her handlers have already left their town or village on an operation, it will be difficult to apprehend them before they reach an Israeli population center. Once they've entered an Israeli city, the Israeli security establishment considers them to have successfully completed their mission, particularly if it was a suicide mission. In other words, if a Palestinian terrorist with a suicide vest enters an Israeli city, the terrorist has won and Israel has lost, because even if that terrorist does not get to his or her primary target, they will almost certainly blow themselves up in a manner designed to kill innocent people. Consequently, Israeli efforts focus heavily on neutralizing threats within and around Palestinian population centers. This has necessitated an Israeli military presence, usually ad hoc, in other words, per operation, inside Palestinian villages and cities, as well as the creation of a system of checkpoints that ring Palestinian towns and lie along major Palestinian highways in the West Bank. The IDF presence in and around Palestinian villages and towns and the system of checkpoints has proven extremely burdensome for Palestinians and represent one of the more onerous and obvious signs of Israel's military domination over the Palestinians, thus contributing to Palestinian anger. Nevertheless, this military presence has proven effective in countering terrorist activities. Much of Israel's success in bringing down the frequency and deadliness of attacks during the second Palestinian Intifada of 2000 to 2005, more of which will be said shortly, occurred after Israel had cut off and invaded most of the Palestinian cities in the West Bank during Operation Defensive Shield, March to April 2002. More recently, Israel has begun constructing a controversial barrier of fencing with sections in or abutting urban areas made up of concrete slabs within the West Bank, designed to make it difficult, if not impossible, for terrorists to infiltrate into Israel. Despite the political, legal, and diplomatic argument over its actual location, the barrier has proven extremely effective in limiting access to Israel from the West Bank, and thus in significantly reducing terrorist attacks. The ability of IDF forces often based on the outskirts of towns and sometimes within them, to react rapidly and effectively when real-time intelligence information points to the whereabouts of suspected terrorists or other terrorist activity, is infinitely greater than the IDF's capacity to send in units to accomplish the same mission from over the green line in Israel itself. 
Moreover, the system of checkpoints, while unquestionably the most aggravating and unbearable aspect of Israel's military presence in terms of the day-to-day lives of Palestinians, have proven to be an effective tool in countering terrorism. A number of Palestinian detainees have reported aborting attacks due to what was perceived as increased security at checkpoints, when in reality activity levels were normal. In addition, checkpoints also allow the use of intelligence on suspected terrorists to be employed without compromising sources. Terrorist suspects detained at checkpoints may think that the soldiers were simply being thorough, when in reality the security service or military intelligence were given a tip by an agent. When terrorists are apprehended in the field, on the other hand, this suggests that someone in contact with the suspect tipped off the authorities and can thus lead to that source being burned. In general, active military operations in Palestinian villages and cities, as well as the widespread use of checkpoints, disrupt the movement of terrorist material, funds, and personnel from area to area and drive terrorist organizations deeper underground thus inhibiting their ability to function. Within Israel, the police are tasked with interdiction of terrorists. Once intelligence information points to terrorist infiltration of Israel proper, the police are given descriptions of the suspected terrorists, and police commanders instruct their personnel to set up ad hoc roadblocks along major arteries leading into a city or area where the terrorist is thought to be heading as well as increasing patrols within that area. Unlike the United States, Israel does not have a color-coded system of alerts, and the entire country never goes on alert due to terrorist threats. Instead, a specific city or limited geographic region will be put on alert, since intelligence is usually accurate enough to provide a general sense of the terrorist's likely target. This policy of limiting the focus of response efforts and public mobilization more of which will be said later, is designed both to limit the sense of fear within the country as well as to avoid the kind of lackadaisical and laissez-faire attitude that invariably develops when entire regions are put on alert, even when the likelihood of a threat in other parts of that region is extremely low. In other words, Israeli citizens know that when the authorities have reasonably accurate information as to the immediate geographic area likely to be affected, They will provide the populace with this information, and at the same time, they will not trouble others with warnings that will almost certainly prove to be empty and unnecessary. The primary agency tasked with preventive activities is the IDF, with intelligence support from the ISA, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and the Israel police within the Green Line, pre-1967 Israeli borders. The most well-known and controversial of Israel's preventive policies is that of executive action, known in Israel as targeted killings. This policy has a number of clear advantages, but also a number of clear disadvantages. At the outset, it should be made clear that Israel assassinates terrorists only fairly rarely in comparison to the numbers of people that it arrests. Between 2000 and 2005, Israel targeted fewer than 200 terrorist suspects for assassination, while arresting or detaining, at one point or another, some 9,000 suspects thought to be involved in some manner in terrorist activities. Only those individuals that cannot be easily arrested will be put on the list, or, in very unique cases, such as that of Hamas leader Ahmed Yassin, that Israel cannot afford to arrest because his arrest would lead to heightened terrorism in order to try and obtain his release. And they need to fulfill the criteria of being arch-terrorists. In other words, senior leaders, planners, bomb makers, and the like, whose removal would significantly undermine the terrorist organization's ability to function, at least temporarily. All decisions to assassinate require the approval of the prime minister acting for the cabinet as a whole. And a case must be made including provision of a dossier with information implicating the individual to be assassinated with terrorist acts and with the potential for contributing to future acts of terrorism. In almost all cases, Israel will prefer to arrest terrorists rather than assassinating them, and this is for two primary reasons. 
Firstly, as the saying goes, dead men don't talk. Capturing suspected terrorists usually yields a gold mine of information, whereas assassinated terrorists are clearly useless as intelligence assets. Secondly, targeted killings often result in international criticism, pressure on Israel, and greater anger and motivation for carrying out terrorist attacks on the Palestinian side. Nevertheless, the policy of assassination, when coupled with an aggressive policy of arresting suspected terrorists, has proven highly useful in disrupting terrorist communications, freedom of movement, planning activities, and the like, as well as sowing distrust and fear within terrorist organizations. From time to time, key individuals, such as the notorious Hamas bomb maker Yiye Ayash, have been assassinated, thus resulting in at least a temporary incapacitation of a critical part of the terrorist organization's apparatus. Moreover, the policy of assassinating terrorists acts to reassure the Israeli public that terrorist leaders and other key individuals are not immune to Israeli retribution. Even though assassinations are not authorized for purposes of retribution, the policy is often viewed as based on retribution by the Israeli public, as well as the Palestinians and international public opinion. The fact that the average Israeli citizen knows that, while the authorities cannot protect them from each and every terrorist threat, they are at the same time executing an active and aggressive policy of arresting and killing terrorists, helps to create a public sense that something is being done, and this thus helps to reassure the public. As terrorism is more of a psychological phenomenon in terms of creating fear across society than a physical one, due to the comparatively small number of victims, reassuring the public and making it possible for them to go about their daily lives thus represents an important victory over terrorism. Perhaps the worst feeling an Israeli citizen can face is one in which he or she senses that Israelis can be killed with impunity while the authorities are powerless to strike back. In general, whether Israel is arresting or killing suspected terrorists, the essence of the Israeli approach revolves around three key assumptions. One, the number of dangerous terrorists is limited, and therefore it is possible to arrest most of them and assassinate those that are not as accessible. This also means that no matter how much rage is produced in Palestinian society as a result of aggressive Israeli counterterrorism policies, including targeted killings, the bottom line is that this will not translate into more terrorism because very few people possess the resourcefulness and capacity to develop expertise in some area of terrorist operations and thus to become effective terrorists. In other words, more angry people does not equal more truly dangerous terrorists. Being a truly effective terrorist operative is a full-time professional enterprise that requires years of training and development and cannot be the preserve of enraged amateurs desperate to strike out at Israel. Those amateurs can and do fill the ranks of suicide bombers, but the suicide bomber without an organization behind him or her to supply the wherewithal can only be a potential suicide bomber. Two, not every terrorist has to be neutralized in order for the counterterrorism strategy to be deemed a success. Since terrorists almost always operate as part of a complex organization that involves logistics, internal security, recruitment, leadership, smuggling, bomb-making, and other functions, neutralizing key individuals in one or more of these component areas of the organization can severely hobble the organization, at least temporarily. 3. Over time, an unrelenting policy of arrests can severely decrease the effectiveness of the organization. With most of the leadership in jail, lower-level operatives are left demoralized and directionless. Most terrorist organizations can be viewed as made up of three levels, with the strategic level providing the overall policy guidelines and priorities, as well as inciting the public to violence and glorification of terrorist values, the operational level providing most of the expertise for funding, organizing, and implementing terrorist activities, and the actual perpetrator who carries out the attack. Israeli policy has focused most often on the operational level, 
trying to destroy the capacity of the organization to actually produce terrorist attacks, though, of course, actual perpetrators planning or in the process of carrying out attacks will also be targeted for arrest. It should be borne in mind that Israel's policy in this sphere is not predicated on the assumption that effectively combating terrorism requires a one-time operation. Even if the operational level of a terrorist organization is emasculated as a result of a series of successful Israeli arrests or targeted killings, other members of the terrorist organizations will step in to take their places and fill these functions. The point is that these new planners, bomb makers, couriers, recruiters, etc., will require a learning curve, and consequently their initial operations will be less effective. Something that has proven to be true, for example, as Israeli investigators found faulty wiring and poorly made explosives in suicide vests and car bombs used in terrorist operations in the wake of successful arrests or assassinations of key bomb makers. This translates into fewer Israelis being killed or maimed in terrorist attacks. Of course, those individuals will eventually develop the necessary expertise to be effective terrorist operatives, but by that time, presumably, Israel will have been able to arrest or assassinate them as well, thus forcing the organization to produce yet another crop of new personnel to step in and fill the breach. Through a methodical and painstaking shaving off of these layers each time they surfaced, Israeli counterterrorism officials were convinced that terrorist organizations would become increasingly less effective and that these organizations did not have the capacity to forever produce new crops of personnel for the operational level. On the negative side of the ledger, targeted killing often results in collateral damage despite the use of UAVs and other technical means to try and confirm a terrorist identity and to assess whether or not civilians have entered the target's immediate area. According to one study, between 2001 and 2005, Israel targeted 156 individuals for assassination, but these operations resulted in a total of 235 persons being killed. Consequently, 79 innocent persons died as a result of targeted killing operations. For example, on July 23, 2002, Israel targeted Hamas leader Salah Shehada. This was an individual who was a key figure within the organization, and Israel believed that by taking him out, Hamas's ability to function would be disrupted for some time. His assassination had been approved by then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon and the IDF was simply waiting for the opportunity to strike when the likelihood of producing collateral damage would be smallest. Eventually, intelligence information came in suggesting that Shehada was in a Gaza City apartment building that was not occupied at the time by any innocent civilians. An Israeli Air Force F-16 was deployed and dropped a one-ton bomb on the building in order to ensure that Shehada would be killed. Unfortunately, Israeli intelligence proved faulty, and 14 civilians were killed in the attack, including nine children. Following this event, Israel shifted to the use of ordnance with lower yields. On September 6, 2003, Israel received intelligence indicating that the whole of the senior leadership echelon of Hamas, including the organization's leader, Ahmad Yassin, was meeting in a specific location. This represented a real intelligence coup and could have resulted in one fell swoop in a total decapitation of the organization. The Air Force carried out an attack dropping a 250-kilogram bomb. The aircraft could have used a 1,000-kilogram bomb. In order to minimize the risk of collateral damage and not repeat the debacle in Gaza City, the explosion, however, turned out to be too small and the whole of the Hamas leadership succeeded in escaping unharmed. The collateral damage issue thus represents a significant moral conundrum for Israel, one which will be familiar to anyone that studies non-conventional conflict. Israel, as a democratic country with a professional armed forces and intelligence apparatus, wants to be able to do a professional job of combating terrorists without hurting innocents in the process. At the same time, the Israeli military knows that its primary mission is to protect Israeli citizens 
and failing to take out key terrorists, who invariably hide among innocent civilians, and thus disrupt the terrorist organization, means that more Israelis will die or be injured in terrorist attacks. Thus, it comes down to the cruel question of whose lives are more valuable, those of your civilians or those of the other side. As noted earlier, terrorism is more of a psychological phenomenon than a physical one. Accordingly, since terrorists target the public's sense of security, a comprehensive counterterrorism policy must also address this issue. Arguably, no country does an adequate job in this arena, perhaps because it is easier, more quantifiable, and sexier to tackle terrorism by attacking organizations, individuals, infrastructure, and the like, whereas creating a greater sense of public security is a project which is both amorphous and devilishly tricky to quantify, and hence justify from the point of budgets and political support. Nevertheless, this is a critical area that needs to be addressed. If the public has a heightened sense of security and thus is able to go about its daily business, and in so doing maintain economic and social stability, terrorists will have very little impact and it will be clear that their efforts are making very little headway, thus perhaps eventually convincing them to abandon such efforts due to their lack of efficacy. Israel's public communication and education strategy is based on the assumption that the more information given to the public, the more the public will trust the authorities and thus follow official directions in times of crisis cooperate with the authorities, and hence increase the likelihood of thwarting terrorist attacks, and be reassured that no matter how bad the situation may be, they will be kept informed by the authorities, thus giving them at least a modicum of a sense of control over their personal situation, since one of the most frightening things about terrorism is its unpredictability, thus enabling them to take certain steps such as not frequenting busy public places, when intelligence information suggests that a terrorist attack is imminent. More will be said about Israel's public communication strategies in the next module. Suffice to say here that the authorities view the public as an asset in counter-terrorism efforts. The more eyes and ears available to spot suspicious behavior or suspicious objects, the greater likelihood that terrorist attacks can be stopped or their impact minimized. Accordingly, all Israelis are taught from a very young age, in school as well as through educational television programs, public service messages, and press accounts, to be aware of their surroundings, including the presence of suspicious objects and the behavioral markers of terrorists. As suicide terrorism became an increasing problem after 1994, people were also taught to look for markers suggesting potential suicide bombers, winter dress, including overcoats during summertime, and individuals standing out in some other way, such as profusely sweating, eyes darting about nervously, erratic behavior, etc. As the public cannot be expected to have full situational awareness 24-7 over extended periods of time, Israel has developed a system whereby when intelligence suggests that a terrorist is headed for a particular Israeli city or specific geographic region as the police and civil guard volunteers mobilize to increase patrols and set up ad hoc roadblocks, the public will be mobilized too. They will be told that a terrorist is heading towards, or thought to be in, a particular city, and that the public should be on the lookout for suspicious individuals and report any and all suspicions to the police immediately. There have been quite a number of cases in which public awareness has succeeded in preventing or reducing the impact of terrorist attacks. This has taken the most frequent form of bystanders immediately contacting the police and a rapid police response. In other cases, however, bystanders have intervened directly, either by physically grabbing terrorists and preventing them from setting off their explosives, 
or by shooting terrorists while they were in the midst of carrying out firearm attacks. Many Israelis possess firearm permits, and those permits allow for the open and concealed carrying of firearms, with the result being that quite a few Israelis go about their business armed. Interestingly, while one might expect official announcements that terrorists are headed to one's town to cause panic, they do not, in fact, produce this result in Israel. Having surveyed some of the key elements of Israel's counterterrorism strategies, the question that remains is, have Israeli efforts been successful? If we look at the issue of Israeli fatalities as one central indicator of the success or failure of Israel's counterterrorism policies, we see a marked improvement in the situation over time. Despite Israel's wealth of experience in counterterrorism, when the second Palestinian Intifada broke out in September 2000, Israel was largely unprepared and at a loss with respect to what needed to be done to stem the massive tide of terrorist attacks emanating from cities and villages under the control of the Palestinian National Authority. Accordingly, the number of Israelis killed in terrorist attacks increased radically during the first year and a half of the conflict. Eventually, Israel decided to apply some new tactics and reinvigorate some of the older ones through a political decision to reoccupy most of the Palestinian cities in the West Bank during Operation Defensive Shield of March-April 2002 and an aggressive policy of arrests and targeted killings. This decision and the subsequent one to begin building a barrier to pedestrian and vehicular traffic from the West Bank to Israel resulted in a dramatic drop in the number of deaths. Overall, the numbers of Israelis killed in terrorist attacks following the shift in Israeli strategy in 2002 led to a drop from a high of 452 deaths in 2002 to 214 deaths in 2003, 117 deaths in 2004, and 54 deaths in 2005. This graph, over a longer time range, similarly shows a decrease in successful attacks, even though attempted attacks remained high. In other words, the motivation on the part of terrorist groups to carry out attacks remained very high, but their capacity to do so was severely reduced. While these policies did not result in 100% success, it was estimated by the ISA that Israel had succeeded in thwarting on average, some 75% to 80% of attacks over the five-year period of 2000 to 2005. Some may consider a situation in which 20 to 25% of attempted attacks succeed to be a failed policy. Others, however, consider this to be a success, given the reality that 100% success is simply not feasible particularly when one considers that the overall effects of so much terrorism on the economy and society were moderate. The question of what constitutes a successful counterterrorism policy is still an issue to be hotly debated. The Israeli experience, overall, suggests that terrorism is something that can be brought down to manageable proportions and that it is possible to gradually reduce the terrorist threat while bolstering the resilience of society and the economy. To sum up this module, Israel's strategic aim in coping with terrorism has been one of risk management rather than risk elimination. Israel's long experience with terrorism has convinced its policymakers that terrorism, like fatal auto accidents or crime, is a reality that needs to be reduced, but that cannot be eradicated. Terrorist organizations can be degraded through the strategies and tactics outlined earlier, but this requires concerted and consistent policies applied over long periods of time. Fighting terrorism is a high-maintenance activity in the Israeli estimation of things. Additionally, Israeli decision-makers view the public as an asset in counterterrorism efforts and also believe that a relatively well-informed public is a calmer and more empowered one, even when the information being given to them is very worrisome indeed. 
The United States, by contrast, still publicly claims that it can defeat terrorism, not only within the United States, but globally through denial of support and sanctuary to terrorists and addressing underlying economic and political conditions that potentially foster terrorism. America's leadership is, apparently, not prepared to concede the possibility that terrorism is a reality that cannot be completely eradicated. As long as the United States can be kept relatively free from terrorism, this approach may have its merits. But should the United States find itself in a position similar to Israel's, in the U.S. case with homegrown terrorism becoming an increasing factor and or with a massive terrorist infiltration of America's borders, it may be necessary for it to adopt more of Israel's strategic approach.